So next up is something actually pretty exciting for us when you know standards organizations are known for moving slow, but sometimes we move very quickly um, when the industry needs it. And that's something that happened in the showing space that our members wanted us to move on quickly and work on. And we've got three MLS organizations really at the top of the industry. So we're gonna bring up Chris Horan, Mark Bessett, and Ken Schneider to talk about the showing hub. Unfortunately, we don't have any parody commercials or dramatic poem readings for you guys. We're just going to talk about showings, but we'll try and be very interesting with it, right, guys? <laughs> but, and between us all, it's so stable, we have six legs. <laughs> all right. So, is Nicole Jensen in the room? Nicole, you have to be so happy with today's presentation so far, right? Last, uh, last fall at Kiowa, we were on the show uh, together, and Nicole was saying, I really wish we spent more time talking about how we do things instead of why we're doing them. So this has to be just like paradise for you all day today. And that's really what we're going to do for like the next 35 minutes here. Um, and talking about showings is, you know, this was something that we worked on together as three MLSs. And we wanted to share the kind of the roadmap of what this kind of collaboration works or looks like on this kind of project. So we called this how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a recipe for MLS collaboration. Has anyone ever watched the exact, exact instructions challenge series on YouTube? I was gonna play the video, but the Wi-Fi is not working. So look up exact instructions challenge for how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And what's really fascinating about this is it's a dad who has his kids and he tells them, give me instructions on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Write it out for me, write out all the steps. This is something that we share with all of our team members at MRED because you make a lot of assumptions about what goes into actually putting together that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And the video is hilarious, it's about five minutes long but it really does show you how often you skip what you think is a common sense step. And that's really what we wanna do today as we talk through our process is all the little things that went into putting together this project and continue to make this project go. So we've got Ken and Mark with us and they're gonna help talk through a lot of this. Um, but as I mentioned, a lot of times when you have these presentations at these conferences, um, not Riso, Riso is great for getting into the details, but a lot of other conferences, you have a big idea and they say, we had this big idea and then here's how we did it, right? And you go from step one, draw two circles, step two, you've got the entire owl. How many people have seen this picture online, right? Like this is what we typically get at a lot of conferences in real estate. And what we wanna do today is we wanna talk through how we drew the owl and actually go through all those steps to make that happen. So we are definitely gonna be getting deep, deep, deep into the weeds today. Um, and we're gonna spend a lot of time talking through the people, the resources, the steps, the processes, the tools, everything we use to make this happen. All right, so we've got Mark with CRMLS, we've got Ken with Bright, myself with MRED, and we are excited to talk about in the beginning, back in April of 2021, which yes, is just a year ago today. And it seems like just yesterday that we started having this conversation and it all started with a brief that Frank Major, uh, the CTO at Bright wrote up. And I don't know if you can read it because it's tiny, but there's a little section on the bottom right corner that says out of scope. And in out of scope, it says building a production solution. <laughs> so when we did this brief in April 2021, what we really wanted to do is we just wanted to start talking about what the problem was. So, Ken, I want to start with you. We got together as three MLSs and we decided that there were these problems to fix. Obviously, new showing entrants were coming into the space. Um, we needed to come up with some kind of solution to have them all work together. So, did we come up as three MLSs with the solution owner and say, like, this is how we're going to fix the industry? Or how did we get that input from users to get that feedback? Yeah, sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, we started off, I'd say it's a little bit of a mix. You know, each, each one of our organizations had the sh uh, various showing services over the years installed in our markets. Um, so we did have a lot of experience and knowledge of supporting those systems, running those systems. Um, there was over 10 years of service within the uh, you know, trend and bright footprint that I came from. So leveraging that knowledge and then also leveraging the customer support information we had, supporting our brokers and agents over all that time from our customer facing groups and support groups, we were able to really start to discuss and talk about you know, high level uh, business case, high level um, feasibility, high level scope, uh, what we thought we could do to solve this problem of creating interoperability uh, across showing vendors in the state. So it was a mix. Of course, we talked to customers and we leveraged a lot of the experience we had though from running these services for, for many, many years. 
And so on the screen, you see like one of our high-level scenarios, one of the user stories we wrote out, some of the commentary back and forth that we put on it uh, based on the feedback and what we were talking about internally. So Mark, you know, how did these user stories that we collected, how did they help build out the initial architecture and design of what we thought we could put together for this product? And then when putting together those data flows, I'll come back and ask you about what was essential for the interoperability of it versus trying to keep them competitive as well. Uh, Brian, yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, one of the key things I think came out of that, that the user stories that we collected was that there really are a, a lot more functional use cases um, that were that were separate. Uh, the buyer's use cases were completely different than the than the listing use cases. Uh, we needed to build some mechanism of abstraction, right? We wanted to make it so that the uh, the use cases that came in and out were going to be able to be separated from each other, agnostic of each other. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a, a, a field, like you can see here with the uh, these different um, members of the spokes here. We wanted to make it so that it seemed like we needed to have multiple types of vendors be able to come in and interact with the system without having a lot of weight associated with integration. So talk a little bit to us about the idea of where was the line drawn and where do we think the line needed to be drawn for interoperability versus innovation? Like obviously, it'd be easy to say, let's just standardize everything and everyone do everything the same thing, but then there's no more competition. So talk a little bit about some of the conversations we had there. So. Um, yeah, so the idea is that in the, in the hub world, we only want to talk to applications. We don't want to talk to, to end users. That's really not, not what the hub's about. It's about integrating different uh, solutions. And the hub is a kind of any kind of competition for these types of solutions. The, it's just there to, to kind of grease the wheels, right? It's the lubricant so that different types of applications can speak to each other without actually having to know anything about that other application. We're only facilitating roles. So the discussions we, we started to have were, how, how can we maintain um, scalability, right? I mean, if you can think about what, what goes into a hub, there's gonna be millions of transactions. Um, is that something that should be centralized across the United States? Is that something that should be decentralized? And I, I think what we came up with from our conversations was, we want both, right? We, we want it to be decentralized to a point where it makes sense but we wanted to be able to be something that could be connected across the United States. And that really drove uh, the, the features that we built into the hub. So Ken, we've got three MLSs, four time zones, over 250,000 agents. How do we make sure that everybody stayed in the loop and worked together on this so we could actually be efficient in this process? Uh, very purposefully. <laughs> um, we started off really thinking, again, we had all this knowledge and we needed to share it. We needed to document things. We needed to... Um, be able to work together. So we set up a weekly meeting, uh, Chris, Frank, myself, and Mark. Um, and the big word I think here that's important is commitment. You know, there's many times organizations try to get together. We maybe meet in person over every 90 days, but we were able to really use a lot of collaborative tools, tools like Box for document storage, Ring Central for video conferencing. Um, you know, I mentioned us four were involved at this point in time, just high level early on. But it was that commitment and using these tools that I think really set that collaborative, you know, how, how are we going to do this working foundation for everything we're going to talk about even, even further. So now we're about like through mid to end of May. Um, so we've had the first couple of weeks of having these initial conversations, working through that brief that Frank put together. And we're starting to realize that there's something here that we actually can do, right? Like we see there's a solution starting to come together. So Mark dropped this one recently in a call with some of our preview participants. Um, and I think this is a great philosophy explanation for what we're trying to do. So as we get into the architecture of the hub, Mark, talk a little bit about the philosophy behind it. That's uh, just what you see on the screen here. Um, we want it to be as smart as it has to be and just as dumb as it can be. Uh, we don't want it to be super complex, but at the same time, we can have something that's super granular and we just need to communicate this messaging um, and not try to boil the ocean, not try to do more than that. Uh, we, we do have some, some plans we'd like to do as things go go forward um, to, to make it easier for uh, showing vendors to come into the place, uh, come into the marketplace to, uh, to facilitate other transactions we might want to do, automate some things. But, but in the beginning, it was like, let's not overthink this at all. Let's just make it absolutely as simple as it can be. So let's talk a little bit of the tech stack too and some of the tools that we use there and what we initially put together. Um, for the tech stack that we originally put together was just simple RESTful service. 
um, and a simple database on the back end. We weren't we, wanted, we didn't want to get too focused in the exact technology that we wanted that were to be used. We were more focused on interfaces, um, what what's going to be uh, available to interact with the hub, and then another key piece is is the messaging, the asynchronous part of it. We didn't want to do any kind of replication. We didn't want to be in that mode. We wanted to be in as near real time as we as we could be. So essentially, the 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 model is we're going to have an action against the hub, and then the hub will send messages. And so all the participants uh, that are the, the the spokes in the hub will get back those messages via like a, a webhook, and then they'll take whatever measures that they need to take in their application, coordinate with whatever whoever their downstream customers are, and then come back and, and take another action. So it's always you know, action, state change, and messaging. That's the, the basic loop that always happens in the hub. Great. So we all run some version of some flavor of Agile in all three of our shops. Um, so Ken, we're doing weekly meetings. We were doing weekly meetings at the point to get all the user feedback in. Now we're starting to get a little bit more on the tech side. So talk a little bit, how do we build our backlogs? Yeah, so to, so to build the backlog, you know, we, we've had got past feasibility, scope, design. We have a pretty good idea of what we want to do here. Quite honestly, none of us do anything. So <laughs> this is where we get <laughs> this is where we get the actual people who can do things. And I want to give a shout out to the four names here because we started to get our product and technical teams involved. Um, Steve Singer and Steve Grubb from Bright, um, and Damian Quinones and Armando Ramirez from CRMLS. They started meeting three times a week from a technical perspective, creating the backlog, creating the user stories. As they were learning stuff and building out that backlog, we were also learning stuff from the business and strategy perspective. So that once a week meeting, we all met the technical team as well as the, um, the strategy team, I'll call it. And we really continued to progress forward in how we we're going to build this, what, we, what it was gonna look like, and, and take it from the, to the next steps. So now we're up to four meetings a week while we all still have our day jobs working on this project. And we decided that wasn't enough we had to start selling the idea too. So this is where marketing started to come into play because now we're building out the infrastructure. We think we've got a solution, but as everyone knows, no solution is good unless you can actually sell it to the people who are gonna use it. So I wanted to bring marketing in. So Mark, talk to a little bit as what story were we trying to provide about the hub with our outbound communication strategy? Well, we had a few stories actually. We, we sort of, the colloquial term we started to use was architecture, right? So we, we wanted to be able to communicate how this is going to work in a way that's simple, a way that people can understand, a way that makes business sense. Um, and, and actually, that business side of it is, is a big, that's where you get a lot of questions. Well, how's this going to work? You know, uh, and we don't even have all the answers yet, but I think now we've got to a maturity where I think we, we really are, are zoned into that. But, uh, but there was a lot of curiosity, a lot of people trying to find out what's going to happen. And so we ended up with more meetings with uh, marketing. More meetings and more people. So Ken, tell us a little bit, how did we want to tell that story? We know what we're trying to say, but how did we want to get that out there? Yeah, sure. So as we started marketing, Chris, Chris took the lead on marketing. He actually did something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and brought in another great group of people um, from all the organizations. You know, Nicole Aguilar and Peter Lundquist from CRMLS, um, John Broadbridge from MRED, uh, Christy Reeves, Debbie Freer, Emily Schaefer from Bright. Each one, great marketing professionals, had some of their own niches, whether it be media, or email or news, but this team did a great job of creating all this marketing material. We built a, we built a website. Uh, we created 10 unique slide decks for the various, various audiences. We realized what was important, so there, there's not one message here. There's a message for brokers, there's a message for agents, MLSs, associations, the media, resale. Um, everybody had a slightly different message that we needed to get across, so all those slide decks were prepared. Great media pitches, email campaigns, presentations. So marketing team, technical team, product team, have another meeting, <laughs> are all really working together now. So, so the how is really starting to get that momentum. So now, for those who keep track at home, we're up to five meetings weekly. And we've got six or 14 different people working in a, across the three MLSs, plus all the people behind the scenes who weren't involved in all those meetings, too. So um, hopefully what you're getting so far is like the amount of effort that has to go into something like this to make it happen at the speed it has happened. Um, and then we weren't done there. We wanted to start building a little bit more consensus even beyond our three markets. Uh, so obviously we talked a lot about marketing and how we tell that story. 
And then next we wanted to obviously work with RISO because this is an issue that isn't just affecting the three of us. It's an issue that's affecting every MLS in the marketplace because, and it's affecting every showing vendor trying to get into those markets because they don't have the ability to interoperate in a way that makes sense. Um, so they're trying to do direct integrations, they're doing individual market setups, and it just basically creates 500 plus different scenarios for them to try and work through. Uh, so we worked with Riso, and luckily this group was just amazing for a subgroup, definitely the fastest one I've ever been involved in. Um, obviously the three of us contributed our metadata. We also got metadata from basically all of the major and new showing providers out there. We had 30 to 40 people on the calls that we did every other week. And this was in a matter of months. We had come together on a standard that we submitted to Data Dictionary that they'll be including in the next version. Um, but it was really impressive on how much participation we got from not just the brokerages and the MLSs, but the vendors in the space, and how quickly we all came to the conclusion that yes, we do have certain things we can share that'll make it easier on all of us. So it was great uh, to work with Riso on that and contribute that back to the industry. And those uh, discussions, you can see them uh, in the data dictionary work group if you wanna go back and look at the metadata that was submitted that's gonna be part of that going forward. So another thing with, oh sorry, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, that I was at a Riso, I don't know how many years ago it was, and and Paul Stuziak, who's in the audience out here somewhere, I'm sure. And I remember him being on the stage and saying, realize whatever we do here is gonna not be hit the hit the market or be in use for four years. That was kind of the model. This was years and years ago. That was kind of the model we were faced with. And and I think it's it's improved, but it is a standards organization with a lot of people involved. And how fast did we do what you just described there, mm -hmm. Chris? Yeah, so that uh, the showing subgroup started in, I wanna say it was July, and we, finished our contributions in December or January for that. And for those of you who have been on Risa work groups, that's really, really impressive that we got through it that quickly. Beyond impressive. And that's mainly because of the participation from all of the people who came to those work group meetings. It's amazing how quickly things move when you have the right people in the room with the right motivation, so. So we're, so we're up to a lot of people at that point. Yeah. If you add all, all the people in, in our organizations, and then you add the people that were from the industry participating in, in uh, Chris's group, and mm -hmm. so that, massive amount of people and yeah. and shrinking the amount of time to market. That was the, the goal there. Yeah. And we weren't done with Riso. We wanted to have a little bit more fun with them. And so we did our hackathon. So Mark, talk to us a little bit about why hackathons work and what our goal was there. So so this is great. So by this time, everyone's got this really cool idea. We've done market texture. You know, we're all patting each other on the backs, thinking oh, what a great job this is. But at the end of the day, right, There's you've got to have a sanity check, right? Is this something that really will work? Is this something that people can do as quickly as we think they can do it? And, you know, we're all getting pressure from our boards about how fast can we get this done? You know, I get that asked to me once a week by my boss, I think, uh, still. So um, we thought, hey, you know what we need to do is we need to do a hackathon. We need to invite people that are in RISO, um, give them a little, little, put a little skin in the game, give them a little money. We, we pitched together, we put some prize money together, and we said, anyone that's is open to it, here's a swagger docs. Here's a Slack channel. Here's uh, what we can do to, uh, we want, what we want out of you is, can you do this, right? That's it. So Ken, let's talk about how we actually ran it, like the logistics that went behind running that hackathon and some of what our teams did to help support that. Yeah, sure. Um, so let's add a couple more teams. Uh, <laughs> as we get to the hackathon, everybody's involved. Marketing's doing a great job promoting it, um, getting the word out. Uh, again, special thanks to Riso for supporting us through that whole process. And, you know. Uh, helping launch it through the RISO uh, fall conference. Um, but yeah, now we need to finance and legal because we, we needed money. <laughs> we had to give some money away. Mm -hmm. And we needed some rules and we needed some contest rules and stuff of that nature. So from a legal perspective, we had to get all that built and confirmed and loaded up. So that was more on the business side. The technical side, the, the team did a great job putting the technology in place, opening it up to all the hackathon participants. Um, we met with uh, via Zoom, Zoom meeting with over 20, 20 registered participants in the entire hackathon. Uh, we answered their questions and comments, anything that they needed to go ahead and participate in it. Uh, ran from the end of that RISO conference over a weekend. Our technical team set up a Slack channel so that everybody on the, uh, on the uh, hackathon had the ability to answer questions, um, get things resolved. We, we might have had to fix a bug or two. Um, but um, it, was a, it was a great effort all around using, again, collaborative technology tools and all the people involved to run the hackathon. So Mark, after such a public showing with the hackathon, why did we decide to dial it back a little bit more and get more exclusive for our preview? And can you talk a little bit about what the preview is? Uh, sure. 
first, let me just say that we had it. Oh, we added lawyers, and lawyers are always the long pole, and they never. It's like, oh my God, now we get away from the lawyers. Uh, but the lawyers in our case really greased the wheels. They made it so that everybody felt comfortable participating in in the hackathon. So I just wanted to throw a shout out to the to the people that we usually like to hate. So uh, anyway. So the preview is all about, okay, so we, we've kind of validated, and, and by the way, the results of the hackathon were amazing. Uh, people came forth, they said, and they came up with their niche ideas, which is really something that we wanted to bring out um, from, from a showing hub perspective. These, these niche types of use cases where someone says, hey, I, I have a, an end consumer, I wanna be able to have him do a, a showing or make a request, or or I want to have uh, I, I have this app and it's all about generating tours and I I need to be able to go to all these different places to get availability and and requests for showings and they have to be in this order and or I have to change the order. they have logic that does all that it's awesome um, and we wanted to facilitate that so we got to the preview portion and we need to figure out okay how we can actually we validated the idea we know that people can do it we've got a lot of ideas a lot of energy. But now we actually have to get this thing released. We actually have to get something out the door that people can use. And so for the preview, we were a little more um, selective. Uh, we had to you know, con conduct uh, all these more meetings, by the way. So now we've got more meetings. Um, we, we meet preparing for the preview all the time, uh, the preview meeting. And then once a week, we get grab everybody together and say you know, what we're going to do. Um, but the idea is that we needed a lot of investment from the particular members, and we couldn't. We didn't have the support. Right? We only have, you know, a couple, three developers working on it. You know, it's a limited amount of, of bandwidth for us, so uh, we we couldn't let the world in. We had to be just a little more selective. Plus, we had a whole new uh, legal agreement we had to, and that took a few bang. That was a little harder to bang that one out, but but we got there. Mm -hmm. So, Chen. What are we learning so far from this preview? And, and before you answer that, like, I do want to call back to when Mark mentioned earlier that the hub, the users to the hub are the showing providers, the technology providers in the space. It's not our individual MLS users necessarily. Um, so this really was like our version of a user acceptance testing group that we're working with on this preview. So what are we learning from our users so far? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's twofold. Uh, from a business perspective, it, it's actually quite simple and, and exciting. The collaborative spirit amongst the showing vendors, amongst the MLSs, everybody involved in the preview ha has been awesome. Um, so I think we're really turning some tides from a business perspective there. You know, from a technical perspective, we're learning what you would probably expect. Uh, you know, on, on the smaller side of things, field names, data structures, updates, frequencies, you know, things of that nature. And uh, what we're really getting into now, I'll call the major milestones, is change management. The uh, whole context of this hub is to facilitate choice in the marketplace. Well, we're going to have to facilitate change management then. So as brokers and agents want to choose their showing providers or change their showing providers, this tool has to be able to handle all those processes, make those switches. Th this is a mission critical system. You know, there's existing appointments out there in the marketplace as somebody might be making a change. So we got to make sure all their appointment requests and everything transfer with them. You know, there's three major cases, like I said, um, you know, people want to switch just because they want to use a different provider. Something as simple as a uh, agent transfer. So an agent transfer is out of an office, happens all the time. What happens to their listing? That might change showing providers on them. They might take their listing with them to another broker, they might not. So um, broker acquisitions. We're trying to work through all those major change management use cases so that when the hub is up and running, those use cases just flow right through, changes get made and coordinated, uh, and it's all synced up from that perspective. <laughs> and I do just want to reiterate what's great about this is in these weekly meetings that we're having with the participants in the preview is, you know, we're giving homework and they're giving feedback to us and they're doing testing and we're making changes and constantly like running one week sprints to get all of this done. And it's why we're moving at the speed we're moving. So let's talk a little bit. Okay. Oh, I was actually just going to say it kind of dovetails on that point. Um, early on in the preview when we started to get into the change management stuff, our team realized, hey, we, we got to meet every day <laughs> to talk about this and get these processes vetted out so that we can present them to the preview group. So, you know, every single day we're meeting trying to define these processes. It's like the old, uh, the old teacher trying to stay a day in front of the class. <laughs> um, but it, it's been a great experience so far. Yeah, not to put you guys on the spot, but I was on the meeting this morning. I didn't see you two, so. <laughs> All right. I, I was busy preparing for this. Good, good job, Chris. 
Okay, so let's, that's where we're at right now. We're in the middle of this preview. We're getting a lot of stuff done. We want to talk a little bit about what's next, right? Like, what what are we trying to do next with this um, as far as the hub goes? And as Mark said when we started this, like, preview is all about launching it, getting something production ready. In our three markets, actually being able to have something that stands up and can host multiple showing providers in one marketplace, that they can talk to each other using this hub infrastructure and then make it so that we have that true interoperability. And then that'll allow brokerages in each of our markets to have the choice to bring in the partners that they want to bring in, and they'll have standards that they have to adhere to if they want to be part of that hub, so we can make sure that they do what they need to do. But that is really what's immediately next. And from a timing perspective, you know, we're all in tech, so none of us like to put in you know, real dates on anything, but we're relatively soon, let's say. Like, it'll be nice and sunny in the rest of the country, not just in Tucson, when this is ready to go, hopefully. So. Um, we're very excited about that. And then some of the other things that we're thinking about what's next is, you know, we mentioned before that this wasn't just a problem for the three of us, right? Like we realize this is a problem that every MLS has. So a lot of what we've talked about is how is how's what we're doing from a architecture standpoint, something that we can share with the rest of the industry. So, and this was actually something that we talked a lot about with the vendors is that they wanted to know that the work they did with us, while that's helpful because we're large markets, that they could use that work in other markets as well. Like that's kind of the sell for them, right? Is that I don't have to then redo this in 500 other markets because you're going to share that theoretically with everyone else. So we're not entirely sure how the details of that'll work, but that is the intent and the philosophy behind this is we do feel like this is something we contribute back to the industry, not just from a resource standards perspective, but from an actual implementation perspective too. So anything you guys want to add to that? Well, yeah, I just want to point out, so well, as we're doing this, what we're working on right now, we're still tweaking, developing the hub. We're getting these more what we think of as edge cases, but they're really not edge cases, right? These are things, as Ken said, are really going to be every day. Uh, every day, someone's going to change their mind about what they want to do. So we have to bake all that in. But at the same point, the reason why the preview is so important is those, those uh, participants in the preview, they're also working on their product to get it ready so that by the time that the hub's actually out and available for use for, for anyone that wants to come to the hub, there's going to be already solution providers that are there. They've already got it implemented. So from uh, all of our customers' perspective, from brokers and agents, they can go to their, their favorite you know, uh, application provider and say either, hey, can I use this one now? Or you know, they'll just be able to rest knowing that their systems are already available for being used. Uh, or being in use, and at the same time, we can bring new people, new people on um, to the hub as well. And as Kent, or as uh, Chris pointed out, we're talking about ways of like, how do we get this to, you know, to the to the re any MLS that wants this? How, how do we get it to them, you know, uh, in, in a way that's you know affordable, in a way that's something that they can they can do? We're, we're not here to make money on this. Um, this is something we we think is really just you know good for the industry. And so those are those are the questions that are, we're starting to ponder now. Um, <clears throat> what's the business? What's the business of the MLS going to look like from, for licensing? I mean, historically, you know, you go to the MLS, they do a big site license. A, a vendor can go there and they they get sort of blessed by the MLS, and the MLS makes a choice for all their members, and and so it kind of blocks out anybody else that really wants to do anything unless they want to do it totally independently. So we want to we want as the whole point here is to make the market open and really allow for all these niche, these really great ideas. Uh, you, you saw them in the hackathon, there's even more in, in the preview, but we want to facilitate that kind of innovation and, and not starve it off at the beginning with an, with an M, with MLS, you know, with this giant uh, site level contract. So the business that is going to really ha endure a paradigm shift, right? So. So now if you've got this showing system, you're not going to be able to necessarily go to the MLS and sell the MLS and call it a day. You're going to have to talk to brokers. You're going to have to talk to agents. And, and I think that that'll be good. I think that it'll, it'll actually change the dynamics of how, of how that funding flows that will allow companies to be innovative. Um, you know, I'm not showing time's a great product. It's just not a product for everybody. Um, HomeSnap's got a great product. They're putting things in, in theirs as well. Uh, they're doing a great job. We have, you know, tours as we can, we can go on with with the list. Um, but but the idea is that anyone now can come with a very niche uh, showing solution, and they are very niche across the United States. Um, there's places where it's ex a very very special weird process, and, and I was exposed to it. I was like, wow, your your whole segment of the country feels like a edge case to me, but not for them, right? 
so we can facilitate someone coming to the coming in and saying, "Hey, we, we got that solved," and we use that. So we're what we're trying to think now is how do we how do we orchestrate this from a business perspective? That's a big, that's really a big a big thing on our on our mind. So, well, and I think that's a great example of you know obviously this is interoperability at a technical perspective, but it's also about cooperation between MLSs trying to solve industry wide problems, and that's kind of what you just ran through there, Mark. But Ken, any final thoughts for you around that subject? Uh, yeah, I'd probably echo some of that same thing, but you know, most importantly, th this is all possible. You know, over the years, there's always lots of hallway talk of MLS is working together, technology providers working together. Here, we have everybody in the same room working together um, collaboratively. It's good spirited. Um, everybody understands how it's going to move the industry forward. So, so that really excites me from that perspective. Um, you know, looking out into the into the future. And there was one other thought I had on my flight over. <laughs> um, Timing is everything. You know, we talked about all the groups of people we had involved, and hopefully by sharing that with this group, um, reach out. We're glad to help if anybody's thinking of similar initiatives or things of that nature. Glad to share everything we talked about from technology to product to marketing, and you know, paint that picture. Um, but uh, overall, I kind of lost my train of thought. Timing. <laughs> yeah, timing. Timing. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was thinking about it on the flight over. I don't know that this would have happened pre-COVID, because we probably would have said, oh, we got to get in a room, we got to meet nine, every 90 days in person. We did everything online. Everybody was used to working with those collaboration tools, and I think that really played kind of a, a background role in making this all happen um, as quickly as it did, too. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, we had that talk last night, and I totally agree. If we weren't all used to the idea of doing that every single week anyways, it, it might not have happened as quickly as it did. So. Um, so thank you both for that. The one final thought we'll put out there is when you're thinking about interoperability and this model that we're doing here, think about what else needs to interoperate in the space and what the MLS's role can be in helping to push that interoperability. And I'll throw in a little plug for the cross-platform interoperability work group later today where we're going to be talking about another area that will be very helpful to have some interoperability going on in there. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, everyone here. And uh, if you have questions for us, you can find us later. But appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.